if they'll say hello to people who are already joining. Uh, there are still more people coming in, so I'm just gonna wait uh, a sec. If you're here for a seminar on motivational interviewing and child and family social work, then you're in the right place. If you're here for a webinar or anything else, I'm not sure how you got the link and you're in probably the wrong place. Um, but we're very glad to see you either way. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a second, explain a bit about how we hope this, the webinar is gonna work. I can be more confident how the webinar is gonna work. Certainly how we hope it's going to work. So I'll just give it a little bit. Greetings from West Wales from Mike Howard. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not going to explain how Zoom works. If you don't know how Zoom works by now, then where have you been for the last 18 months? Uh, the number's still going up a little bit. I'll wait a little bit more, maybe half a minute, and then we'll make a start. Right from Portsmouth, London, Glasgow, Wrexham. Wow. Cloudy Telford, that's unlucky. It's sunny, sunny Cardiff where I am. Northern Ireland, you can't see how many people are there. Yeah, it's at least, it's at least a dozen, or if not more. There's quite a lot of people here. The numbers keep ticking up. So. Scotland, Iceland, Cardiff, and Finland. That's the furthest one I've seen so far. Mm. Hi, Finland. And in Swansea, that's not as far. Still nice there. Um, da -da -da, the number's still going up, so I feel like I, if I, oh, yeah, Hertfordshire, lovely Perth, Scotland. Stuff. It's really lovely seeing Scotland, where everyone's yeah, coming from, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, I like who a variety of places. Yeah. Thanks, whoever kicked that off. Sue Williams, some familiar names there. Hi, Sue. Yeah. Montreal, very nice. Well, that sounds like the winner so far. You might just kick things off and then I'm sure yeah, people probably, will join as we probably make sense. Thing. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask people to introduce themselves, but I am gonna introduce myself to begin with and uh, give a little bit of an explanation, I guess, about how we think the webinar is gonna go. And then um, everyone else that you can see on screen, Charlie, Stephen and Donald will uh, introduce themselves. So I, I'm David Wilkins. I'm going to try and chair the webinar. I am going to chair the webinar today and try it, which mainly, I think means mainly trying to keep us on time uh, primarily. Uh, so we've got an hour uh, and we're going to do uh, the webinar in two halves in the first sort of 30 minutes. Uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy listening into a conversation between the four of us about um, motivational interviewing and um, family social work. Uh, we've got some questions to ask of one another. Uh, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to do that as we go through the first um, kind of 30 minutes. After that, I'm going to try and wrap up. Uh, and uh, at that point, we'll be looking at questions from the audience, by you good folks out there from to Montreal to sunny Aberdeer and everywhere in between. So if you have questions uh, or, or comments that you want us to look at, um, then please do put them in the, in the chat as we go through. Uh, we're not, we don't guarantee to answer all of them. If we only get three questions, then we will answer all of them. But if we get lots and lots of questions, we're going to uh, take our, uh, take it in terms to pick uh, the questions that kind of leap out to us as being uh, the ones that we're um, kind of most interested in. But we'll try and get through as many as we can, of course. Uh, if your question is picked, then uh, you will find, uh, I think your mic is, uh, will be unmuted. Uh, and uh, that will give you the chance to um, contribute or, or clarify a question or, or, or offer a kind of follow-up. Um, so don't don't be too shocked if your question is picked that you're you're um, uh, unmuted. Uh, that's assuming we can find you in the list of attendees, which our, our excellent uh, professional support staff will no doubt do their best uh, and achieve that. So I think that's everything. Uh, so for the first half hour, and, and I, think, I, I think for all of it, you'll just be able to see us. If you have got technical problems, pop them in the chat and, and one of the professionals will, will try and help you with that. Um, so um, let's go, let's have some introductions. Uh, I, I don't mind who, who wants to go first. Char Charlie, just because you're on the left of my screen. Let's do yeah, some introductions. Of course, um, I'm Charlie Whitaker. Um, I'm the curriculum lead for motivational interviewing in my current role at Frontline on the Frontline programme. Um, and I know David and Donald from a previous role at the University of Bedfordshire. We worked together on a, a, on a research team. Great, thanks. Um, Donald? Um, so I'm Donald Forrester, I uh, lead the Cascade Centre at Cardiff University. And we uh, wrote this book together on motivational interviewing. And I suppose I've been doing research and training on motivational interviewing for 20 something years now, uh, inspired by uh, Steve and his work. But D Dave, do you want to introduce yourself and then we can maybe hear from Steve? 
Uh, well, so, uh, so I'm David Wilkins. I'm a, a senior lecturer in social work at uh, Cardiff University. And uh, as Charlie said, worked on, on, on various projects with, uh, with, with Charlie and Donald and lots of other people on, on motivational interviewing. Um, as Donald mentioned it, it would only seem rude not to. This is the book uh, that we wrote and that I guess is part of the reason that we're here, but not the only reason. Uh, and there is a link to the, to the book somewhere in the chat. I'm sure that will be repeated a few times if you want to have a look at that. There's also a code that gets you a discount on the book as, a, as, a, uh, as an attendee of today's session, which is, which is exciting. Uh, okay, St Steve, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, my, my name's Steve Rolnick. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I've retired about seven, eight years ago. I come from beautiful Cape Town, you'll see in the background, and I'm a co-founder of MI. So yeah, that's me. I'm talking, Great. speaking from Cardiff. Great, thank you everyone. So I, I think we're gonna start with Steve, if that's right, you're gonna give us a, a little bit of a, an intro or, or three, four minute <coughs> kind of introduction to, to, to MI and some thoughts about um, today's webinar, I think, or questions that are on your mind. So, so I'm gonna hand back to you for that. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, I think it's only just struck me having come on to this, this webinar, that it's actually a form of celebration. Um, I, I mean, I say that having read this book my, myself. Um, so I want to say many congratulations for a really wonderful piece of work. Uh, so I found it so refreshing. So in the spirit of celebration, um, I suppose it's not a bad idea to tell you a story. And I thought I'd, I'd, I'd just start off by giving you an overview of motivational interviewing and then addressing this question of where it fits into childcare social work. And I'm gonna take about four to five minutes. Is that all right with you? You guys, you okay? Great. Okay, look, a motivational interviewing started as a, as a form of therapy in addiction and then widened. And for me, I was a young nurse in an alcohol treatment unit in Cape Town, South Africa, age 24. And there, the conversations and consultations were quite confrontation and, con confrontational and formalized. And I thought this was normal professional practice. I, I, I wasn't that impressed with it, but it was only when I got to Cardiff some years later that I came across this paper called Motivational Interviewing which actually presented an alternative to coercing or persuading people to change, which is what motivational interviewing is, in which they, rather than you, say why and how change might come about. So if, you know, uh, David, if you wanted it in 20 seconds, that's it. It's an alternative to persuading and coercing people to change in which they, rather than you, say why and how change might come about, okay? Now, a couple of observations for you guys. Um, it's motivational interviewing is not client-centered or practitioner-centered, it's both. A lot of what I'm saying is with the benefit of hindsight, okay? So I've stopped the historical story now. It's not non-directive, or directive, it's both. And my journey, my personally, my journey has, has been one of moving through addiction treatment, mental health, into general health. And then after I retired into schools and sport, there are so many common challenges across these settings. And MI, it seems, has a place as a form of helping people, even possibly at home. So wherever you're in a situation of wanting to help someone to grow and change, there's this possibility that MI might be useful. So I've described quite a wide tent. I mean, that brings us in a way right up to date because Miller and I are busy writing the fourth edition of our text. And this has been our starting point. In other words, tough conversations are widespread and they often involve change. And if I now go right back to the beginning, it was the late 1980s and we were sitting in Australia, Miller and I, um, I urged him 
to use, not to have a theory of motivational interviewing in this book, but to use the concept of ambivalence as a sort of an anchor. And we did that and we have done that ever since. And so we agreed not to produce a theory of motivational interviewing. And that was in line with our, our sense that the best knowledge and wisdom to begin with is going to come from observing everyday practice and from the inside of everyday practice. That's where we wanted to start. Now, you'll notice I haven't said a lot about the content of the method of motivational interviewing. Perhaps, you know, out of respect for David, who wants me to give bite-sized pieces. Okay, how's this, David? Motivational interviewing is a style of conversation much like that of a guide with associated skills for getting the best out of people. Okay, so that's me stripping it of the jargon. I could include all the jargon. I cannot see why it's necessary. Well, we can go into some of the more detailed technicalities, but that's it in one sentence. I would say before I turn to childcare social work, am I doing okay, by the way, David? You're happy. You've got thumbs up. Okay. I'm very happy. I'm very happy. Oh yeah. Okay. I have not. I'm not looking at the chat column, um, but do do uh, let us know if you're happy. Hey, um, I'm not prattling on with a lack of clarity. No. Good. Okay. Um, a couple of of exciting new developments for me have been. Uh, I, I thought I'd mention three. One is the integration of advice giving and motivational interviewing. So I've been working on, on that for some years. And for those of you more familiar with motivational interviewing, I think this involves adjusting and fine tuning what, what I called the writing reflex 20, 30 years ago. In other words, instead of polarizing motivational interviewing with advice giving, which was a mistake that I feel I was principally responsible for, I've now been working on the integration and can speak to that if anyone's interested. That might be quite useful in, in child and family social work. The other exciting development in recent years for me has been integration of restorative approaches and motivational interviewing, restorative circles. Um, and some of you might be interested to know that my most recent in, in, uh, application of that is in football and in halftime team talks, We've got some elite football teams doing restorative circles in the six minutes of half time and emitting change talk. So and that's a, it's a great example of motivational interviewing and restorative practice being integrated. So that, that's about how wide the tent gets, but I'm having a lot of fun with that because I love sport. So that's, that's why I'm exploring it. Okay, briefly, what about child and family social work? I mean, I've just got questions for you guys, right? And I'm hoping it will help us. Um, I've described motivational interviewing as a way of help, as a form of helping. Okay. And it, there are many other forms of helping. And I'm not suggesting it is the only or the best form of helping. It is a form of helping. No question about it. And it's very similar in, 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 in manner to, to the style of a guide. Okay. And so looking back for me, I now realize what I observed in Cape Town, uh, where some quite violent things were going on among the clients, was very unnatural and over-formal conversation, where patients were interviewed with closed questions, it was actually quite unnatural. And in a way, what's, what's happened to me and in the development of motivational interviewing was a journey in which the conversation is transformed into something much more natural and much less formal. And, and like Johan Kreef said about football, he said football is a very simple game. Playing skillful football is one of the hardest things to do. So the fact that I describe it as a normal sounding conversation doesn't mean it doesn't require skill. Okay. Look, end of that rant, I, I, I thought I would just pose a couple of questions to you now. Is, is child and family social work a form of helping? And what does that mean? Um, I wonder whether it isn't 
both client-centered and practitioner-centered, and that's fine, okay? Uh, in which case, there could be quite an easy fit for motivational interviewing into this activity. I do worry in social work, as I have in, in many other fields, that MI has been misperceived and sucked into a purely client-centered approach. And I think that's been a mistake that I've made in promoting that and others have in taking it up. The establishing of a good relationship is critical, fundamental. Staying client or patient-centered is fundamental. But MI is a lot more than that. Okay. And finally, I thought I'd just mention two highlights from your wonderful book, you three, really. I, and I say that sincerely because I've, I've written quite a few books on MI. When I opened and read this one, I thought, this is actually the most well-written and interesting. And as familiar as I am with the material, I didn't find it, uh, I got bored at all. You know? So I wanted to thank you for a wonderful contribution. My two favorites are Aesop's fable about the wind, the sun, and the man with the coat on which maybe we can come back to. That's a fabulous. The other one is this idea about purposeful dialogue. And I'm very intrigued to, to, to hear what you as a team mean by that. Um, and perhaps that's not a bad point for me to stop. I hope I haven't gone on too long. Not at all, that was fantastic, Steve. Um, uh, so I, I, I think I may start by responding to the first question about is child and family social work about helping? And then, uh, Charlie, it might be interesting to hear a bit of the work you're doing as part of your PhD, analysing social worker interviews, which speaks directly to this question. Um, and then come back to you with some questions, which I'm, I'm sure we've all got from, from what you've said. Um, uh, th there's, there's, a, there's a great study from back in the 70s uh, by um, Jeff Pearson saying uh, about social work students and their main... Uh, motivation is to help people that's why people become social workers and i'm sure that's still true to the present day that 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 and, and as he argued then it's that is a in, in a capitalist society that is itself a radical imperative it's, it's great i guess one of the reasons i became involved and interested in motivational interviewing is is that sense that perhaps as a social worker i wasn't helping people and in my first studies which were around parental substance misuse um I, I discovered I wasn't alone. That, that's most of the social workers described really feeling quite stuck. And I remember more than one saying they were visiting a family, kind of waiting for something to go wrong, but they didn't feel they were actually helping them. Um, and I felt that that was because there were very difficult conversations to be had when I was a worker and then these other workers, and they they didn't really know how to have those conversations and so they they, they felt that they were um, just waiting for things to, to, to bad things to happen um that wasn't good for kids wasn't good for uh the families and i don't think it was good for social workers i think it contributed to them feeling burnt out and disillusioned um so for me I, I then sort of those were cases where parents misuse drugs or alcohol, I, I turned to the substance use and misuse literature to try to find things that were helpful. And MI was the thing that seemed most close to social work values and, and most applicable. And we'll talk about that more. Um, but it'd be really interesting to hear, Charlie, you say a, a bit about, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just have. Uh, but, but I know that you're studying social worker interviews. Um, so I don't, I don't know what you think about whether social work is uh, helpful or meant to be helpful <clears throat> yeah it's a big question um i think i set out my phd trying to explore how social workers could have more helpful conversations about change because my assumption having been a social worker was that that was at the heart of what we do that we're not involved unless something needs to change and part of my studies have been listening to recordings of practice and I think the thing that struck me is that so few of the conversations are about change. And I, and I don't know yet what that's about. Um, I don't know whether that's because people are fearful of talking about really difficult subjects, whether it's because social workers see change as something that happens elsewhere and not as part of our role. But I certainly went into it thinking that that's what we do is we help people change. And now I'm questioning whether 
whether that is what we do and if it's not why is it not and I don't have answers to those things yet but it's definitely shifting my thinking um I, I could say something about that but Dave, David I don't know if you're wanting to chip in yet um no I think just just echo echo what other other people have said I, I guess really I think um you know back in when I was a social worker in, in practice I, I guess I felt like there were some conversations I had that I felt were more helpful than than others, but but I didn't necessarily have the time or the space or the, the sort of reflective ability within the, the the context of a sort of busy job role. Really think about what well, what was making some of those conversations more more helpful. And I I remember I'm not I, I remember um, Donald came and spoke at a conference at a local authority where I was working, and he and he talked about uh, uh, empathy and how empathy uh, was related to to parents. Um, feeling able to, to talk more about themselves and to share more of their problems to, you know, parental disclosure, you, I guess you could call it, but it was more than just disclosure. It was, you know, often just, just being open and comfortable. Uh, and I think that led me into then thinking about, so where, where does that idea come from or what's the framework around that? And that's where, that's where I came to MI and thinking, is this something that can help unpick, you know, where you do have those health conversations? What is it about those conversations that you could try and do more of? And what is it about the unhelpful conversations that you could, you could try and do less of? So I think social work is, I guess my answer to it might be different to other people's, but I guess that's why we're having a conversation is it, it, it can be a form of helping social work, certainly can be a form of helping, it certainly should be a form of helping in lots of occasions, but that doesn't mean that's the only part of its role, it's more complicated than that in the sense that some families don't need. Yeah, uh, and sort of, so to actually try to answer your question, uh, I think some, as David says, sometimes social work is about helping people um, either because they acknowledge they've got a problem or because you're able to work to a position where there's some sort of shared understanding. But I, I guess quite often social work is not about that. It's about kind of other things that that uh, may be helping someone, but it's not, it's not, it's nothing like a therapeutic conversation. So in the book, the sort of extreme example we have is, if there's a child who's experienced serious abuse who's been locked in a room and you're having a conversation with the parents, um, you, you need to see the child. That is non-negotiable. Is there any space for um, uh, MI skills or, or actually values uh, in such a conversation? Um, now, that's not a helping conversation. Uh, but it's that type of raising concerns, explaining consequences thing is an important part of social work. You could say it's helping the child, we hope. Um, but uh, I, I, I think there are, there are both issues of practice and issues of principle that make MI a particularly good, for com good fit for conversations like that. So just that in practice, it gives you skills and tools that, that can help make those incredibly difficult conversations less likely to be unhelpful and more likely to be sort of collaborative while recognizing you know, it's a very difficult situation. But I think the reason for that is, is uh, for me, it's a slightly philosophical one. And I don't know how much we go into this in the book because we have this constant thing about is MI a technique or is it a kind of philosophy? And we slightly sidestep some of these issues. Um, but, but for me, the, the fundamental principle of MI is that other people have got choices to make. They have some element of self-determination um, within their lives and that they should be respected <clears throat> as, as that should be respected. And I think it sounds really obvious, but once you really believe that, you have a different sort of conversation with people. And that unfortunately, a lot of children's services work ha for very complicated reasons has become pressured into telling parents what to do. Whereas if you realize that parents have actually got decisions to make, even about whether they let you see that child in that locked room, you know, they need to understand the consequences. So they may need to understand that if they say no, you will go and contact the police and come back but they they need to understand that and I, so i think mi and the skills of mi and that principle allow you to begin to think about how to make those into dialogues um is this does this sort of make sense to you steve or yeah it really does it really does it's interesting listening to it with my background in in healthcare because um if you observed consultations for example in um uh, uh, where I was quite recently in uh, a high deprivation marginalized community in uh, South Africa, there's not a lot of talk about change. Um, and the impression that I got was that that's because they're managing problems, which is a bit like the scenario you just described. 
But then when we worked on this, we noticed something else, that it's possible to shift one's mindset from I manage problems to I help them do this, including like Donald says, make a decision about whether they want us to see the kid in the room. And that, that healthcare practitioners, and I wonder about social workers, could experience a lot more burnout from feeling responsible to solve every problem in front of them. And almost, you know, uh, 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 which starts with like compassion fatigue, seeing so much of the stuff over and over, over again and feeling responsible. And this shift to a joint effort to help the person solve a problem takes the weight off the practitioner's shoulders. And maybe that's why you don't see a lot of conversations about change in your tapes, Charlie. I don't know. The hypo my hypothesis is, is that they're solving problems. And my point about healthcare is it's possible Yes, to address problems, but to shift the focus and promote empowerment and choice in the person you're speaking to, and those very problems get resolved. David, sorry, Steve. I, I think that's that's a really um, useful perspective because I think when I when I I remember when I first started looking at MI, and I can't remember now what version of the book I read and the, and the first, uh, you know, sort of the, the coding manuals and everything which sort of describes the skills. But there were skills in there, I guess, that I sort of recognized from social work training, like empathy, like collaboration, which you'd, you'd expect to see as a foundation, I guess, for almost any form of helping. It's hard to imagine how you would help someone without these things. But the, the idea of autonomy and promoting autonomy, I, I found quite new at the time. And, I, you know, it wasn't something I'd particularly thought about or come across before. As a social worker, but the idea that actually, you know, a fundamental to your role is not making a decision for someone else. It's saying you have, you know, choice to make and actually trying to expand someone's sense of my autonomy. And that might mean talking to them in a, in a certain way about options that they have. It might mean, as Donald said, talking about some of the consequences of things that might happen if you if you make different choices. But also saying what resources do you need to feel like you've got the ability to make choices and to feel like you've got some autonomy in this situation. So that was almost quite a radical thing I found at the, at the time of, of an idea of an approach to social work. Um, I think it's one that people still struggle with. Um, the idea, I think it's difficult in social work that on the one hand, you, you know that people don't change unless they want to and that ultimately it's up to them. But it feels exceptionally difficult as a social worker to actively promote a sense of choice when you know that that might lead to really dire consequences for a family and holding that feels really hard. And I think it's the bit of MI that for a lot of social workers is the sticky bit. Like how do I genuinely promote a sense of choice without feeling that, you know, I've, I'm either being disingenuous or that I'm actually causing harm because there might be a really negative consequence by somebody choosing not to change. I don't know what you think about that, Steve. I think it's a very um, vivid description of, of a challenge which I don't feel I should be a smart ass or a clever guy in relation to, if you know what I mean, because it's not you know, it strikes me as very complex. And, and if you look at uh, a comment of somebody like Henriette in the, in the, in the chat column, um, you know, that, that, that comments are made about um, tough conversations. I mean, imagine that scenario that Henriette's describing. So that confirms my, my sense that, that there are very tough conversations. They have an impact on outcome, how you handle them and they have an impact on the practitioner. And what I learned from the, from the healthcare world was that although we talk a lot about other people and change in other people, actually good practice probably starts with ourselves and how we look after ourselves and clarify why we're doing what we're doing. So um, that's another whole story, but you know, I hope you found that helpful. Conscious that we are halfway through the webinar, and I suppose as chair, I feel slightly under under pressure to note that fact. Uh, we have got questions 
uh, that people are, are, are kind of um, posting both in the chat and in the, uh, uh, now I said, if you didn't know how to use Zoom already, you won't know how to use it. I didn't know there was a Q&A in Zoom. So I, there you go, I've learned that. There's a Q&A function and there's a chat function and people are using those to post questions. Um, sh should we move on to look at, look at some of those? Um, yeah, and just to say, we, 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 we hope to make this interactive. We're delighted that we had you know, almost 400 people sign up for it, which is brilliant. And, and that, the way we're going to do it is, as David said, we're going to pick some questions and read them out. And as that happens, that person will be unmuted so that they can uh, either respond or add to their question um, if, if they want to. Um, so uh, I, I think we're just going to pick different comments or questions. So do keep them coming. There's some fantastic, really interesting ones coming through. Uh, I think we were going to said Charlie might start, but do you feel happy to do that, Charlie? If not, I've got a question that's for you. I'm just reading through them as we speak. If you're you're welcome to ask if you would like to. So Jackie Tioto has asked um, about why social workers don't talk about change, and she's wondering whether it's the pressures and volumes of work leading us into processing rather than being change agents, because the latter takes more time, and about how important processes become over the importance of relationship. Um, so, yeah, do you, do you want to kick us off, Charlie, as it was? Yeah, I mean, my sense from the, the practice that I've listened to is very much that practice, certainly in the recordings I've listened to, is very process driven. There's a sense that there is so much to get through and timescales that are so tight that almost it feels like there's not the space to talk about change, which, you know, it seems seems crazy really given that our role is to that, that we're going into somebody's life to tell them that something does need to change that we then don't have the space or feel that we have the space to actually address that so absolutely I think there's a sense of you know going to check in because a time scale has said that we need to check in and um, certainly a really key reason I think that change isn't being spoken about I think there's probably others as well around not feeling confident to talk about change about there being so much you know often we're involved initially for one reason and it becomes apparent quite quickly that there are so many different things that we can sometimes feel like we're drowning and we don't know where to begin um but certainly the pressure of the systems that we work in i think shapes our practice more than anything else it would be quite interesting if if steve you've got thoughts on other um areas or, or agencies because you know social workers work under a lot of pressure that can lead us to almost sometimes dehumanizing the people we work with because you've got so much on but we're certainly not the only profession where that's the case while while you think about what others there are i, I suppose I, I i've got two parts to to an answer that i was answering that question one is as charlie says that the pressures definitely lead to that and, and if i think about my elements of poor practice it would be you know at the end of a friday when you've seen four people that afternoon and you you know everything's really busy and and, and that those pressures um uh, make it harder to to be really human when you're with people but i suppose it's also really important to say child and family social work isn't just about helping um some of it is about uh, investigating concerns and sometimes deciding actually no help is needed here or or um even if there is you know, very often help there are changes that would be good but they're not sufficient for us to say legally you have to do something and so maybe we close the case so there's assessment and deciding and really the, the rights of parents to parent within a broad range of what's acceptable um, and rights of children to protection we're, we're constantly balancing those so i think the conversations are not about change partly for procedural reasons but partly because social work is not really it, helping is only a, a minority of what social workers do in, in my opinion but Steve, I don't know if you can think of other experiences in other sectors, or presumably this is an issue in other places. It is. It is. Um, and this strikes me as particularly tough, the context that you're describing. I must say, um, I, can, I, I can think of some settings in criminal justice where it gets tough, but not in the sense of, of holding almost in your hand and heart the well-being of, of, of a family that's at least kind of existing there. Um, and they're not deprived of freedoms. I mean, so no, Donald, I've got nothing to say other than a sense of, of um, awe at the complexity of what you sometimes have to go through. 
uh, and a conviction that it, 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 the well-being of the practitioner is critical. Yeah, and then I've got some other comments about affirmation and, and the positive way of looking at people, but I'll keep that for later. Uh, we've also got Jackie with us unmuted as it was uh, your question. So I don't know if you have anything to add or, or any observations or, or thoughts on, on um, what we've just been talking about, I guess, Jackie. Well, really helpful answers. I think um, we have to start thinking about why other professions aren't put under the same pressure as social work and teaching, which are heavily regulated. I never hear anyone saying surgeons have got to go faster when they're doing open heart surgery. Um, and there's a question really about what Stephen just said about whether family and children are as important as a, to us as a society that we have time and we can take enough care to do the work. If, if changing requires you as a parent to, to have time with a social worker so that you can keep your children, is that as important as surviving when you're on the slab having your heart open? I would argue that it, it is, but I'm not sure we, we narrate that in society enough. And I think we have to step up a bit uh, and start demanding really that it is as important. Otherwise the fabric of everything starts to fall apart. And I'm in the, the business and we are under the most pressure we've ever been under really. So I think it's for us to start a new discussion about the importance of getting this right. But thank you very much. Fantastic webinar. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Um, so, uh, so who chose that first question? I forget now. I think it was Donald. It was you, wasn't it? So. Oh yeah, but it was meant to be Charlie as usual. Yeah. I just waded in. Do you do you have surely, one, Charlie? Surely not, Charlie. Because if you don't, there's another I like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing a very good job of reading the panel at the same time as listening. Yeah, it's I'm tricky, afraid. Can I read one while you pick one? So Charlotte Round, so I'm looking at the Q&A panel, um, asked one that I think is a really important one for social workers. Uh, she says, uh, you mentioned social workers wanting to help being radical under capitalism. How far do you think MI, oh, she's just moved. Uh, how far do you think MI can really be applied when working under a capitalist neoliberal system, especially when social workers are working closely with people living in poverty? I guess this is something I struggle with um, quite a lot, but I don't know, David, if you have thoughts on that? I well, uh, ooh, do I have thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good question, isn't it? Like, like, um, like so many of them, it, it's it's huge, and you could do the whole. Uh, this is me just spinning my wheels now. Why remind myself of the question? Yeah, no, I think there's 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 absolutely. Um, uh, I, I think uh, you know a role a role for MI, um, uh, you know, within within you know even the kind of unequal society that that we live in, that people are using it and finding it helpful. I think what your question speaks to for me is the the risk of forgetting that that's the context you're working in when you're asking people to make changes as if things like poverty and inequality and racism and all those sorts of things aren't affecting people's lives and limiting their opportunities and their, and their choices in ways that are you know structural and not not individual so I think it, it can be used and used well not that you know but the risk is that you forget that that's the context you're working in and, and that, and that um, there's a, a pretense that there's a kind of neutrality to choice or a neutrality to something. I, uh, he's shaking his head he might be disagreeing which yeah, is good or, or that's, that's me that's uh, i mean I, i'm not <laughs> dis disagreeing with you personally i'm just very struck by when was it it was march last year um, i got the last flight out of south africa uh, before the COVID curtain came down and I was working with a group of, of uh, mostly black, but other e e ethnicities as well, trainers in motivational interviewing. These are people on the front line in townships and in healthcare, right? So get that context, right? And I mean, if ever there are problems of, 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 of poverty and marginalization and all these things. Um, and I said to this one, this one uh, nurse, I said, how's it going to be for you now going out there? She, she said, I have, plagues come and go. We carry on with the work. OK, so she's a community activist, primarily in her work as a nurse. Right. Her use of MI comes into the conversations that she has with people but there isn't some kind of split between mi on the one hand which which we all know you know it's not just about the change in the individual and uh, you know wider social change and economic change on the other so there's a story about somebody who integrates the two so that's my view as well 
But okay. I suppose I do struggle with this in the MI. There's a danger that MI individualizes just because it's about how you have conversations with with individuals. So I, I think it needs to be used with a, a social and critical hat, or else it becomes dangerous. And I, I, I did a really good role play with the students about a, a, a mother who couldn't get to her kid to school, and she in the role play made up that she she didn't have enough money for the bus fare, and. So the student was sort of saying, well, but what could you do to make sure you had enough money? And then we had to take a time out and say, so should we be saying this is up to the mum to get the bus fare? And, you know, what, what should she manage her money differently or something? Or actually she's poor and she needs help with uh, getting more money and maybe social services should be doing that or uh, et cetera. And I don't, I don't think there's an easy resolution to this. Um, and I suppose a, a problem is some of the big social theories that, that we deal with in social work you know let's say about the impact of poverty that the problem is that they can be less specific about practices but then the practices can can sometimes leave out some of the bigger social stuff and, and for me it's critical you have both you have a critical understanding of those social issues and the communication skills to 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 communicate with people who are often have had long experiences of disempowerment for, for all sorts of reasons um yeah you, you there's more questions coming in, but Steve, you were going to say something about affirmations. So, uh, did, I don't know if Charlotte had a, had a comment on, on, on the question that we were just discussing, but um, yeah, sorry, I don't Charlie. know if she's gone or been, been, um, been, un, been un Oh, right, sorry. Char yes, Charlotte Brown, because that was your question. That was all. I just wondered if you had any follow ups or thoughts on, on um, I guess, what we've just been discussing in relation to your question, Charlotte. This would be not in that in that respect. Okay, if, if you have, you can always pop them in the in the chat. I think. Uh, sorry, Steve. No, not at all. I don't know. You're asking me to comment. So I was asking. You, you mentioned you wanted to say some things about affirmations. Yeah, I could. I thought I thought I'd also mention while while I have you, so to speak. Um, you know, raising very tough topics and dealing with tough conversations isn't unique to social work, okay? Um, and because the very people you deal with will appear in health, will appear in healthcare settings or in criminal justice settings. So, and there's an aspect of MI that um, I have found incredibly useful here, which is if you have good quality listening skills, you can make progress much faster because you engage with people quicker. So I think that helps with some of the time pressures. But then the, 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 the skill of focusing allows you to raise difficult subjects. And in healthcare, we've, we've worked for many years on what we call a gender mapping, where you can lay out the different topics. So, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to look at your book and see, you know, how you deal with that, because I think that could offer social workers a way of being able to dive in and out of different topics, some of which has you in difficult position of, of, you know, taking a tough stance on something. But, um, so I just wanted to mention that, um, because I'm trying to be constructive. But the, the other thing I noticed um, in that work I was doing in Cape Town just l last February, among the practitioners, these are trainers. So these are, if you like, converts to MI, so to speak, okay? They're people who are highly skilled was that they viewed these people they saw as having tremendous strengths and they worked with those strengths, okay? They didn't just see the people they're seeing as a whole long list of problems, okay? And that energized them and energized the people they're seeing, even if they only had like literally two minutes with a person. I mean, that, it gets tough in healthcare, you know, five minutes with somebody, boom. How do you have a conversation that's really tough in five minutes that is driven by a positive perception of someone as, as a human being uh, with rights, with freedoms, and with strengths? The, the skill of affirmation is a natural consequence of viewing people in that way. Uh, and I've only realized... Bill Miller says it was me that introduced affirmation into MI, and I thought it was him, and tr in truth, we don't have a clue. We don't know where it came from, okay? 
But I've noticed it since I've moved into education and into sport, how incredibly widespread is praise used. Uh, and also at home, just, just today with one of my kids. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a gentle but very powerful shift if you can affirm someone rather than praise them. So I wanted to just mention that as being something that's well worth learning about, even if you use it at home. Uh, no, so do you want to say a bit more about the difference between affirming or I would like you to say a bit more about the difference between affirming and praising because we obviously have all <coughs> sorts of different levels of experience here. Oh. Okay, I'll Sorry. tell you one brief story, um, two brief stories. Um, I was doing working in a voluntary capacity in a uh, addiction counselling service here in Cardiff and um, a real heart sink client with multiple health problems, multiple addictions. Um, and in serious social and economic trouble, was about to have a leg amputated, but they wouldn't because he wouldn't stop smoking. And he had a short life expectancy with type one diabetes. No, the list is as long as you can, you can get it. And he came back one day after about four sessions and says, I want to tell you I stopped smoking. And I was flabbergasted, right, how this happened. And I said, that's amazing. How did that come about? Tell me. And he said, it was something you said. And I said, well, what did I say? He said, as I left last time, you stood up and you shook my hand and you said, you are a dignified person. Okay. Now, I'm not telling you the story because I think I'm particularly clever about it. I, I wasn't conscious of doing it. I was just behaving like a human being with another human being and pointing out something I noticed in him. That's an affirmation. Okay. And it's quite different to praise. If you think about it, you're shining a light on something inside someone that no one else can take away from them. Whereas praise is a judgment that you make, you know, and in the world of football, I've come across uh, footballers who say they became so addicted to praise that when the praise dried up, they became depressed and they didn't function well. Right now, how widespread is that in education? OK, how widespread is that at home? Uh, one other quick example, Donald. Um, and this is a bit wild, but it's, it's another example of affirmation. I've got a football coach in an in a, a elite academy in Britain who, instead of saying from the sidelines when they're practicing, well done, that was a great pass, okay, uses affirmation instead. So he might say, some vision to see that gap. What he said is he notices that the other players also want to play with vision as a result of the affirmation that he made. They're not coming to him for praise or lack of it. They're getting the idea of vision as something that's inside me that I can use. So there's, there's two examples, and I think you can see for me, this is quite heartfelt and um, something that we can use every day uh, at home too. Can I have a go at picking a, a question? Yeah, yeah, do, do. Uh, So, so well, I, I guess I'm going to try and wrap up a few questions because I think there's there's been a variety on this topic, which is essentially along the lines of um, social, you know, which we've been talking about, but I, I think just to just to try and f flesh out a bit for people who are asking it, you know, social workers are so busy that, you know, back to Jackie's question, they have time limited, you know, the, the, the time that they can spend with families is really limited. They've got lots of things to do. Is it is it really realistic, I guess, is something like at the heart of these questions. Is it really realistic to think that social workers will have the time to do something like, you know, uh, applying MI skills in practice when, um, you know, they've got that, that really busy context or, or essentially are we setting up social workers to, to fail? You know, here's a standard that you should be achieving. You're just too busy to do it. And, and therefore we're going to be sort of um, critical in a friendly way of that, of that system, if not of the individuals within it, but critical of that system. But actually uh, we're sort of setting the bar too high by expecting people who have got so much to do. So I think we probably touched on elements of that, but I think there's probably a good half a dozen questions that pretty much ask, ask that. Um, so I don't know if people have additional thoughts beyond what we've said. I, I wonder if it's worth responding to that, David, with a comment that I've read in the chat by Wayne, which says there's something for me in the MI spirit that I feel should encompass all that we do in social care, regardless of the barriers. And I think that's really the sentiment that carries through in the book as well, that it's not just about applying the, the skills, it's about the value base that you approach 
the people that you're working with. Um, I don't know if either of if either of you want to say any more about that. Well, I completely agree. I, th I think it's about genuinely wanting the best for the other person <coughs> and believing that they've got uh, choices and decisions to make, and that that provides the whole context of the conversation. I mean, on the sp specific issue of time, I mean, it'd be really interesting to hear what, what the rest of you think, but I, I guess there's, there's, I disagree and I, I agree. So in terms of actual practice, I don't think it takes any longer to practice using an MI way. Um, indeed, uh, what strikes me is how many other interviews time is wasted with unhelpful discussions or arguments or, or just un check lack of purpose in interviews and all sorts of things. So, I, you know, I, I, I just don't, I, I'm, in fact, I would say the opposite. I think when you're using MI, probably interviews overall take less long and you probably don't need to work as long with families because you're not wasting as much time in argument and disagreement. So I don't think the pressures of time on a sort of day-to-day -day basis are actually an argument for not using MI. But where I do agree is becoming good at MI or becoming good at anything requires time, it requires reflection, it, uh, you, you need to be able to think about what you're doing, you, be, you need to be able to make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. And I, I, I think there, there's a challenge for MI, but actually for any, any approach, which is how as a profession can we allow uh, social workers to, to become better and better at their jobs? How can we build in the processes that are needed for that? So I don't think MI takes any longer. In fact, I think it takes less long than normal practice, but I do think the processes are, require time. I don't know what There's a really think. interesting comment in, in the chat about that from, from Mayuri who says, I agree, but it requires thinking space. And I th I'm quite struck by that in the sense that, you know, maybe if, if you're just, you're not going through the motions, that would be too harsh. Just, you know, but if you're, if you're rushing from visit to visit, which often social workers are, in fact, perhaps they're always rushing from visit to visit, you know, yeah. where is your time to really think about what's the, why am I here today? What's the purpose? What might be the family's purpose? And that thinking time, it may not be available whereas if you if you're taking an approach that is is just okay i've got to you know we've got to check that you've got a copy of the plan i've got to check that you're you know i've got to see your kid's bedroom i've got all the things that social workers have to do that, that takes less thinking time uh, that struck me as a comment that maybe you know, something about supervision that's something about um reflective practice that's something about treating that thinking time as a sort of central part of the role rather than you know stop sitting in the corner thinking and get on with the job but actually thinking mm -hmm. is the job and it's part of the job yeah um, yeah can I, can, you know, I, I think that's right. And so we are, we, we are agreeing that the well-being of the practitioner and their learning journey um, is where good practice starts. But a, 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 there, is a, there is a paradox here because inside a conversation, if you listen well, you save time. Okay. You save time. And that's not just because the, the, the person is on board with you and there's a sense of collaboration, but because it allows you to cut corners. Because if you adequately capture what someone's saying, which is what a listening statement or empathic listening is, you can move on. So I think listening saves time. And indeed, when you make a reflective listening statement, you are handing the conversation back baton over to the other person and Mayuri that gives you the the thinking space in the interview yeah so if you have to solve every problem that comes your way you're talking too fast and you saw and you don't have thinking space but the beauty about listening is that it saves time and gives you thinking space I hope that's helpful we... no no I agree and and also the you know, very often if I listen to interviews that there's unnecessary, it, because the parent in particular feels that the social worker has not understood what they're saying. They keep trying to make the same point again and again and again. You don't understand. I'm under stress. I'm not happy. I'm sick of social workers. You're always coming here. And because the social workers, instead of sort of trying to show they've understood that, it's trying to say, but we have to come because it's a child protection investigation and the law says, did it? And, and, you know, whereas an MI approach just can help defuse a lot of that because once someone really feels that you um, understand their point of view, they stop constantly trying to do that. So it definitely saves time. But David's point, in fact, I don't know which version of the MI handbook is, uh, handbook I call it, your, your Miller and Rolnick, uh, that, 
that this is incredibly helpful thing that the people who taught you MI were your the clients, the people you worked with. Once you learned that change talk and sustain talk were like a green light and a red light, then they were constantly teaching you through feedback what you were doing that was helpful and what wasn't helpful. And I, for me, that was transformative. I thought, actually, it's not necessarily about having to... The, the, the knowledge is not somewhere else. It's not the four of us sitting here. It's, it's the people we work with are constantly giving us feedback. But what we need is organisations that allow us the time and space to use that feedback so that we can be thinking about what we're doing and getting better at it. And I guess that's the great struggle we have in social work to create reflective, thoughtful, practice-friendly spaces. So fantastic to see all these comments coming through. But... Too, yeah, too many for us to get to. I'm gonna do a bit of chairing now because we have four minutes uh, four minutes left of the, of the webinar and, and far too many um, really interesting and thoughtful questions to get through. So uh, I'm gonna make a couple of suggestions. I know Wayne uh, who, um, I think I certainly asked one of these questions or we picked up on a comment that Wayne made in the chat. So uh, first things first, if that's okay. Wayne, you're unmuted. If you had a comment or a thought on anything we just said, that would be great to hear. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I guess I was just I was just thinking about a small follow-up. You, you kind of have wrapped up most of what I want to say. I mean, in terms of like making space and making time, I just want to say that we're having conversations with our clients anyway, so why can't they be done in an MI conversational style? In terms of the spirit of MI, I don't think that's something that, I mean, I hope that's not something that we need to make time and space for. I hope that's a way of being that we can carry into our work anyway. And this is, I guess, an important distinction between trying to carry the spirit of MI through our interactions, engagement and relationship building with clients. That's not, not quite the same as mind kind of an umbrella or foundational idea or way of being that underpins then the skill of delivering MI. And then the last follow-up I had is, is Donald, you just really said it really is that for me is this, this issue of social workers are really busy. Yes. Yes. Social workers are, I'm not a social worker, but I do work in social care as a, a family recovery worker. So I'm working with the adults within the families. We are really busy. Um, I don't think that's going to change. And so what we really, really need is the buy-in from our organization to uh, to buy into the spirit of MI and make that space, as you said there, Donald, to enable us to be able to get skilled at delivering and utilizing motivational interviewing, but also maybe just to bring us back to a place where we recognize that the value base is the same uh, as social care. Although if I can be so bold as to say it, sometimes I don't always see that in terms of what we experience day to day within our roles. So that would be my follow up, yeah. Thanks, uh, Wayne, that's some really interesting reflections there. I think, you know, that you picked up on that distinction between sort of doing MI and, and just behaving in a way that, that uh, you know, treats people as, or to use Steve's affirmation, dignified sort of human beings uh, with, with rights and freedom and all the things that you, you covered. Um, uh, Lucy just saying she has to leave. Well, it, it, in fact, Lucy, I think we all have to leave in the next uh, couple of minutes because we're nearly up to two o'clock. Um, uh, apologies to everyone whose questions we didn't um, get, get through. I have a suggestion of how we might deal with that. Uh, we certainly weren't avoiding uh, any of them on purpose. We, we went with the ones that struck out. I hope you think we engaged at least some of the more difficult ones. We weren't purposely picking ones that we thought would be easy. Or, well, I can't speak for Charlie, Stephen, Donald, maybe you were, but I, do, I doubt it. Um, so uh, there'll be a recording of it. People have been asking that. I'll be on the Cascade YouTube channel when, when ready. Um, uh, did we mention there's a book? Yeah, there is a book and, uh, you know, we'd like you to buy it and find it useful. Uh, definitely we'd like you to do both those things, I guess, or, or read it if you can't, if you can't buy it, read someone else's, I guess. Um, uh, we're going to have a look back through the questions, or certainly this is my suggestion, uh, we will try and do as I'll, I'll try and include uh, my other fellow uh, panellists in this. We'll, we'll look back through the questions and we'll try and write some something in, you know, we'll try and put something in writing essentially as a kind of Q&A to be circulated. You, know, you won't get the depth of the, the discussion and the, and the back and forth, but I think, you know, we'll, it, where we can, we'll try and pick out some of the questions that perhaps we didn't get to and see if we can just do a kind of written, written Q&A at the very least for people and circulate that round. Um, any, any final comments, Randy? Thanks everyone for coming, I guess is my final comment. I, I, I enjoyed that uh, and um, learned a lot from, from being here with, with Charlie, Donald and Steve. I mean, it was great. And there's so much energy in, in the <clears throat> questions and the comments that I really think we, we should think about how to take it forward. And, and um, we were talking this morning about maybe a network or further sessions or something. Um, but there's the, And also so many of the comments are so wise and thoughtful. It's really worth reading them if people um, haven't had the chance to. So I, I think we, we want to take this forward, but it was great from my point of view. Um, 
don't know, Charlie, Steve, do you have fi a any big final? thank you to everyone. I think picking up on your thing that we have a ready made network of people here that are interested in MI and child and family social work. And I think if we could think about how we build on that, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. And thank Thanks you, Steve, everyone. for making the time. Really, really, really appreciate yeah. it. No, I'm more than happy to dip back into your world. No problem. That's great. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Um, and um, we, we will do something following up on this. But thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.